Okay, so here's the uh, short lecture on deviance. And the first thing to say about this is that deviance is a whole topic on its own. You can take a course in the sociology department just on deviance. Um, it's also closely related to criminology, which is, uh, um, you can take two or three courses on that. Um, and so um, this is, this, you know, two readings is just to get a kind of flavor for the idea behind the sociological study of deviance, and in, in particular, obviously, the perspective on, de on deviance from the study of sociology of culture. Okay, so we want to be thinking about these questions in terms of sociology of culture. Um, this first article, the Becker article, um, you'll remember Howard Becker, we read something of his earlier, the Art Worlds, uh, selection from his book Art Worlds and he was himself a musician before he was a, a, a sociologist and that's probably what promoted his interest in Art Worlds but it also gave him access as a musician um, in I think it was nightclubs I'm not sure what city he was a musician in but um, he had access to a lot of you know social networks where there was a lot of behavior that was considered deviant like the use of marijuana um, going on and so he had access to all this to all this um, social behavior that he wanted to document and study and um, that's kind of how this came about um, and even though it's written in the 50s I mean that's kind of one of the things that I think is interesting and sort of fun about this article is to think about this you know academic trying to understand um, this deviant behavior in the 50s when it was even more stigmatized then um, and uh, and you know some of the conclusions that he comes to that um, are, are dated but are still relevant. I mean, people studying deviance still refer to this as a sort of foundational thing about the learned nature of deviant behavior. And uh, um, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So the first, there's two sort of points in the sociological study of deviant behavior that I want to touch on. Um, both touched on this article, but this first one. Um, is less so. He has another article about marijuana use that is, goes into this more about the social construction of, the, of, of marijuana as a deviant behavior. Um, he doesn't talk that, about that much in, in this particular article, but, but the point is just that um, what we think of as deviant is a socially constructed thing, okay? And this, this smaller bullet point here um, that's important to sort of caveat is that just because we say that deviant behavior is socially constructed, that doesn't mean that we're moral relatives. So I think that sort of freaks people out sometimes. They think, oh, if you're saying it's socially constructed, you're just saying that anything goes as long as society believes it's okay. And that's not at all what it's saying. Okay, we're not, sociology doesn't really concern itself with um, answering like what is absolutely moral or not. That's, that's probably more in the discipline of philosophy. Okay, but even if you do, even if people do hold to a, a, a belief that a particular behavior is absolutely right or wrong, um, even if that's true, there is still a social process through which people come to understand that behavior as right or wrong. Okay, and that is the thing that sociology is interested in understanding, is that social process. How do people come to that belief? And then how do those beliefs inform the action of the individual who holds those beliefs? Okay, so it doesn't, to, to buy into the idea that deviance is socially constructed does not imply that we just think anything can go as long as society believes it, okay? Um, but the second point that this, and this is more what this particular article is about, uh, this bullet point that says participation in deviant behavior is, at least in part, learned, Okay, that's what he's documenting here. And I think that we need to be a little bit careful. Um, it's not, the, the claim isn't so strong that, you know, marijuana is completely a learned behavior and that even if it was a, a placebo and not, not really marijuana, that people could, could uh, have the same effects on their body. Um, because obviously these substances, I mean, marijuana or alcohol or nicotine, cigarettes, I mean, they do go into your body and there is something objective going on. They are altering, you know, your state of mind a little bit. Um, and so that part is obviously not learned. He's not claiming that that part is learned behavior. 
what he's saying is that even if the, even if people do engage in this behavior, partake of these substances, and have these experiences in their body, there's still this interpretive process that has to go on. It's like people have to decide what this feeling means and how to respond to it behaviorally. And that's the part that he's saying is learned. And that he shows in a pretty convincing way through these interviews um, with marijuana users that it is this learned process. People have to learn sort of like they get descriptions from other people what it's supposed to feel like and then they interpret their own feelings um, and experience in light of that of this um, social context where other people are telling them you know and not just telling them how to act but also just demonstrating how to act and um, and I think that's the main point that um, to participate in it becomes this social process because you're you're viewing other people and, and you could obviously say the same thing for I mean even like coffee even something like coffee that's not considered deviant um, is something that is very social okay we have these whole you know, we have these these places called coffee shops where people go and participate in this ritual of you know drinking coffee together and all of the behavior surrounding the partaking of this substance is what is the socially constructed part and what is learned behavior and um, and so I think that that's all I want to say about that there. The discussion question there is pretty easy. Just going over one of the, you have to talk about one of either two of these uh, things that I've just gone over. Okay, the main thing, the main article, it's also pretty short. It's only like seven or eight pages. Um, this hookup culture article. And uh, again, this is not a gender course, so this is more a lot of these, uh, this Armstrong, Elizabeth Armstrong and Paula England are the two main researchers that have done a ton of research on this hookup culture. And uh, a lot of this would be really relevant for a gender course, but again, this is not a gender course, this is a culture course. So we want to think about these gender questions, but in light of the sociology of culture. And um, and obviously the, the uh, question being posed in this article is hookup culture bad for young women? And um, I think that at the beginning of the article, you sort of get the flavor that they're saying that it's not bad for young women, okay? And I want to make that clear that they're not necessarily saying that, okay? They're, they're responding to what they see as sensationalized journalistic accounts of what's happening on college campuses with young people and the changing nature of sexual behavior among young adults in American culture. Um, they think that the people who are these journalists, this one in particular, um, that they kind of single out, their claims that this is such a bad thing, they just want to challenge that. So they, you know, they just want to say that it's a really complicated question. It's unclear the advantages and disadvantages that are emerging for young women um, relating to these, this emerging, you know, these emerging practices and the, the way that uh, sexuality is changing. So, I mean, I don't know, the article is pretty straightforward and short, so I don't think I need to go into too much detail. Um, but they see, you know, they're kind of holding up a dichotomy, which um, is like young women have the choice to either be in a committed relationship or participate in this hookup culture. I mean, obviously you don't have to do either, but I think their running assumption is that is that a lot of young women in college are going to choose one or the other of these um, paths and actually probably both at different times okay um, and uh, so they want to look at the empirical data and think clearly and sociologically about the advantages and disadvantages of both of those sets of choices and um, Elizabeth Armstrong especially in some of her other work is more um, clear in her some of her findings about the disadvantages she sees for young women to being in, in committed relationships and that's not always the case I mean um, if, if young women can find committed relationships where it's an egalitarian situation, there is no inequality in the relationship, then that is clearly, I think, what the data shows the best thing um, for these young women. But the, I think what Elizabeth Armstrong would argue is that that's rare, okay? So um, there is still so much gender inequality within relationships, within committed relationships, that a lot of these young women become bogged down and in the article, she uses the term. They use the term greedy. These relationships become greedy. They take a lot of time. She, they show in other in another paper that um, women who who come into who you know become a part of a particular kind of 
non-egalitarian relationship are more likely to not finish college or to take a lot longer to finish college because these relationships require so much of their energy. Um, and that's the thing that I think Elizabeth Armstrong especially, but probably the other two as well, are kind of, would, would kind of argue is these, the disadvantage to some women um, of particular kinds of committed relationships. Um, but then also, they, they're, not, they're not saying that the hookup culture is the, you know, the cure for that at all, because they um, acknowledge, and Armstrong in England have another article that's in the American Sociological Review, which is the most prestigious sociology journal, um, that shows really convincingly about um, the differential in sexual satisfaction a, between men and women in hookup uh, scenarios. Um, so men experience much more satisfaction in hookup scenarios than women do. But then B, um, women in hookup sexual situations experience much less satisfaction than women in committed relationships, okay? And I think that's sort of like a, an important feminist point that Within community relationships, there is um, emerging. There's more. In, there's more equality than there used to be, and a lot of that has to do with sexual practices that tend to be um, pleasurable for men or women or both. Um, and uh, and so there's more of an expectation, basically, for for men to perform in a way that's pleasurable for women within a community relationships that within a committed relationship that does not exist yet in hookup culture. And I think that's where they're saying is the real sort of like inequality in hookup culture is that as long as like as this uh, as a young, you know, uh, kind of thinking about a stereotypical young men in one of these situations, they have less, um, they don't really have a belief yet that there's, that there needs to be mutual um, pleasure in the same way that men do in committed relationships. And so, there's uh, advantages in just that, you know, it's not just about saying hookup culture is bad and relationships are good, or saying that relationships are bad and hookup culture is so much more empowering to women. They're not saying either of those things. They think that inequality and double, and double standards need to be challenged in both committed and casual relationships. So, um, for the paper assignment, that hopefully is clear enough from the uh, paper prompt, but. Um, I want you to, you know, there's just two main things. I want you to talk about the data and the evidence, okay, in stating your own opinion about this question. Um, and they present plenty of it. You don't even need to do any outside research. There's plenty of, of, of data just in this article. If you want to do more outside research, look up Elizabeth Armstrong and Paula England. They're the two main researchers answering, um, working on this problem. Well, obviously, tons of others, too. Um, but uh, you don't have to do any of that if you don't want to. But then the second thing is to frame your whatever you're going to say one way or the other or, you know um, doesn't have to be one way or the other it can be a mixed answer like they give um, it has to be framed in terms of the sociology of culture so again thinking about and I give you lots of potential um, examples in of, of past readings from the course that you can use in your paper um, but the point is to really think about this question that's really about sociology of gender and sexuality but thinking about it in terms of culture, okay, and um, and how we've talked about culture in this course. So um, hopefully that's clear enough. Please let me know if you have any questions. And that's it for this one.